I'm going to talk about something that's quite different from the scale of things that we just heard about. The Alaska project is the epitome of the large, giant projects done by the giant companies hoping to sign long-term giant deals with lots of money and 115,000 pieces, pieces of pipe, etc. Well, we have something a little bit different. And I think there's room in the market for all types of projects. And I think that uh, as the market shakes up, maybe we'll see which kind of projects are most likely to go ahead and which ones aren't. But we are quite confident, things are really looking good. And unfortunately, we can't read this as clearly as I would have liked to it. But before we actually get into the project itself, it's, I think it's interesting to kind of talk about where we have come over the last few years. You know, this industry has been around, one can argue, since Kenai in Alaska 1969 or the Algeria 1967. It's been around for 50 years. And I would venture to say for the first 40 something years of this industry, there was no, no change. It was a static business as far as I could see. You know, I was involved in it 20 years ago when I first started uh, in Alaska in 94 in the, in the Alaska LNG project. So it's one of many iterations. But the point was the business model didn't change, the players didn't change, the system didn't change. But the dramatic changes we have seen since Fukushima, I guess in many ways, is truly mind-boggling. And I think we need to sit back and you know, kind of recognize how dramatically things have really improved for the industry. You know, in the old days, the resource owners were the project developers. That's just the way it was. So you found this gas, you looked for a local market, you know, let's say, first you had to be a big company to find the gas because you needed a lot of gas. If you're a small company that happened to stumble upon a lot of gas, the big companies would buy you up pretty quick, or you're a national company. You found this gas, you look for a domestic market, oh no, there's no domestic market, what do I do? I'll sit on it for another 10 years and think about it, or maybe it's enough that I can actually do an LNG project, we're gonna develop the markets, and we go from there. But the resource owner, and the projects were explicitly linked. That's just the way it was. Today, the link between the resource owner and the energy developer is not required. <clears throat> the link is being broken, which is a phenomenal change in the way things are. And it's exactly the way things should be when you go to a deregulated industry, you go to a, um, a competitive industry, that's the kind of trend you want to see. The LNG projects were always developed by super majors because they were large projects that required lots of money. And <clears throat> There was an impression, which I think is proved wrong, that only they had the technology and the project management skills to do this. Now, you know, we in the middle, you know, people, we all work for companies, we all have KPIs, we all measure how well we do. Well, if I was going to ask someone who comes to me and says, I'm a really good project management, I have great project management skills, I'm going to ask them two things. Are your projects on time and are they on budget? So the same big companies that have been around the world telling people that they have the best project management skills, I think in the last few years have failed on both accounts pretty dramatically. How many Shell projects, how many other companies, I'm not going to name names, have actually been on time and on budget, but probably not. And what's been another really interesting trend in the last X years is that the technology that's been actually being developed in-house by these super majors is actually not that much compared to how much has been developed by third parties. You know, the air products of the world, the Honeywells, the, the CBI, all these companies are the ones that are actually on the forefront of doing these interesting things, the Bechtels. And the old companies just hire that out and use that, which is fine, it's very efficient, but so can you know, smaller companies get the same access to the same technology. So that is really quite exciting that now we can be the entrepreneurial company, we can be the company focused on using off-the-shelf technology and have the same abilities to do something that the big guys can. Of course there's niches, I mean, you know, I don't think small companies should be doing trading with FLNG. I don't think any small company should do FLNG in general. But let the other guys, you know, spend the billions and billions and billions of cost overruns to figure out what that really means. We'll come in and just use the stuff that's off the shelf. Plant sizes are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, there was this incredible chart you've seen that, you know, we, at one point, we had small trains and then suddenly, the train, every train had to be bigger than the last train. And then the Qataris came along and built 7.8 million ton trains, one after the other. And the bigger was beautiful. Well, you know, bigger is not always beautiful. Bigger is beautiful when you can actually keep your cost per ton at a reasonable level. That whole link fell apart after the Qatari projects. You know, we can all go back to the Equatorial Guinea days where it was $200 a ton to develop a project. 
You know, and I now live in Australia and I see these projects that are 4,000 or whatever number you want to use, dollars per ton. It's hard to compare because some things are put upstream and some don't. But the point is, we have lost all control over the cost. So now there's a chance to actually come back and think small is beautiful again. Less complex is the way we need to go. So this is another great change that's been really interesting. Sales contracts, we've talked about this many times, were rigid, non-flexible, non-transferable. We have now in the last few years seen a change in that. So why are we kind of doom and gloom? I mean, most of the people this morning were pretty pessimistic because the last few months have shattered our confidence a little bit. But you know, I, I do think that this is an industry that we have gone through ups and gone through downs and every up and down may not be the same as the one before. And we learn from those mistakes, but I think we are and we should get used to the ups and downs. So what's happened in the last few, few months that have really freaked us out? Well, you know, we had this impression the good times will never end. Right, all these conferences, I mean, you know, I go to a lot of conferences and you know, the mood was always you know, party till 1999, as our friend Prince used to say. And now we see demand flattening out in Europe, things are actually going down. I mean, we've talked about a lot of interesting stuff. I'm simplifying, but you know, maybe, maybe there's a bit of a shakeup going on. One thing that I think is very interesting is, and this is my skeptical view, that the companies that ran the business linked the price of LNG to oil because the impression was, oil prices always go up, right? Who in this business believes that oil prices will not always go up? That's just the basic principle. That's why you drill the well, because damn it, oil prices will always go up. In the long run, oil prices always go up. They always go up. That is what we have been taught from day one. You know, and if they go down small for a short time, they'll still go up in the long run. So don't worry about it, they always go up. That's why we link oil price and gas price, LNG price, because hey, you link it to something that's going up, LNG prices go up as well by, by corollary. Well, Suddenly we're saying that maybe that's not always the case. Maybe we are now at a point that markets actually do care about cost. And maybe prices and cost are related and we need to worry about these things a bit more. We always thought, you know, over a few, till a few years ago, or till maybe earlier this year, or last year, that markets always would like gas. Gas is the transition fuel, the golden age, all this other good stuff. And I still believe a lot of it. But now we realize that market actually cares about energy. They don't care about gas, they don't care about coal, they don't care about nuclear, they care about the price of energy. If you think about power, they generalize. In the power world, that's all the customer cares about. He cares about his bill at the end of the month. So if he looks at the bill and says, oh my God, this is expensive, he's gonna tell his utility that's too expensive. The utility runs around and says, well, I have spare coal capacity, let me get cheap coal. So it's a relative price of gas compared to the other fuel that really makes a difference. So it's not like they're always going to choose gas, they're going to choose gas relative to the price of other fuels. As the other fuel prices have collapsed, the demand for gas goes down, end of story. It's not so complicated in my view. So anyway, the market's happy to switch. And we also thought that the traditional players, and it's always interesting, I go to a lot of conferences like many of you probably do, you know, and you look around and you see great discussions, a lot of smart people saying a lot of interesting things. But how many traditional players are there in the audience today? There'll be a few here and there, but not enough. How many traditional players go on stage? How, how often do you see the Qataris or the Exxon or the Chevrons really say something interesting and not just a read, it, a read script that's not very boring, not very exciting in the first place? Not very often. So my view is, it's because they have a certain business model which works and they would rather continue that, that business model and all this is a bit of a distraction. But this is the change. We are talking about things that are fundamentally changing in the marketplace. And I think it's kind of like the dinosaurs. You know, you kind of plot along and one fine day you don't exist anymore. Well, they're not going away, absolutely not going away. But the point is, little guys, interesting guys, and new business models are gonna be that disruptive force. And that's, I think, we should not forget. So having said all of that stuff, you know, let's get over the fact that LNG is not anything special. It is a commodity, a commodity that is gonna suffer price swings, it's gonna suffer from uh, disruptions, it's gonna suffer from <laughs> substitutions, and it's also gonna welcome new players. New trading companies, new financial companies, new uh, developers, all this is all part of that commodity transition. And it's great news. It's not bad news, it's not doom and gloom. This is exactly what we want to see. We want to see LNG become a commodity. Become it's a commodity 
the price, supply, demand signals actually make sense. What we learned, Economics 101. LNG cannot be based on Economics 101 because it's bloody priced on something that had nothing to do with LNG. It was priced on oil. So how could you ever use your Economic 101 principles? You've got a supply line, a demand line, the cross, it's the price, right? We all learned that in Economics. But if it's based on oil, then why are we basing the price of LNG on oil and the supply and demand line of oil? It doesn't make any sense to me. So now we bring it to a commodity. We bring it to what it should be. And it's fantastic. It's fantastic because it's going to sort things out. It's going to sort things out because it's going to bring efficiency and it's going to bring the right kind of price signals to the market. So that's what we want. So let's embrace the change. And on that note, here we are. Texas LNG is all about the change. We are trying to actually make some fundamental changes here. We want to be the credible alternative to the status quo. Because the status quo has worked, but now we are in a change, a time to change. So let's figure that out. We encourage all the usual stuff, flexible and no destination, all that kind of stuff. But we also want to be transparent about the pricing. We want to have true gas and gas pricing. We're going to worry our overlying goal to everything, apart from safety, of course, is cost control. The market, the industry has lost control of its cost, and that's why we're suffering the backlash today. So first, it's all about cost control. How do we keep our costs low? Because in a commodity environment, you can have price that goes up and down, and that's great. But if you're the low cost producer, you always get highest in the merit order, right? And the high cost producers, they're the ones that you know have to worry about the pricing. So low cost, that is the absolute basic bottom line here. So, you know, we are also a realistic project. We're not building 20 million tons, we're not trying to go trying to change the world here. It's two million tons in phase one. And we have permits for another two million tons, or we're going to apply. We're applying for permits for another two million tons. So four million tons total at the south of Texas, right at the border. You can read this very clearly. A couple of important things: most of our feed engineering is done. I'll talk about that in a minute. Samsung is already uh, is a, is our engineering partner. They are also an equity partner. Very important. We have an EPC contractor, EPC technical advisor that also owns a share of the project. It sounds very different. You never see this in any other project, but for us, it promotes incredible alignment. On the other extreme, you look at how Anadarko is doing its Mozambique project. They are doing a double feed, spending $400 million a piece on two different consortiums, two different engineering companies, spending 800 million bucks to then get an answer for feed, which it has now involved 10 different companies, and it's not clear how the project is even gonna go ahead. To me, that's when you don't you let your cost get out of control. For us, it's all about controlling the cost. So we can do this. So it's interesting. <coughs> Off the shelf technology, air products, all the usual stuff. And we have just announced that BNP Paribas is going to help us with our financial stuff. Our project site is very close to Kathleen, who just spoke an hour ago. Her site, uh, she's up here. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We have a 625 acre site. It's a massive site for only a 4 million ton project. We're on the Brownsville Ship Channel right very close to the Gulf of Mexico. The Mexican border is actually right here. Very close to the Eagle Ford. You heard all about the Eagle Ford. They're flaring two, two BCF a day. Lots of gas. What are we gonna do? This is a great alternative. And also what's very interesting for us is the fact that the Mexican government, the CFE has announced the plan to put a 2.6 BCF pipeline from the Eagle Ford to Mexico. It's actually gonna cross right in this area. So for us, it's an absolute win-win situation that we are now going to be an intersection of some major pipes. There's lots of gas in the area. It's all looking very interesting. Uh, this is the usual two million ton project, initial phase and next phase. Very large site. I think it's important to have a very large site compared to your project because it makes permitting a lot easier. We're also using electrical drive compressors because that makes permitting a lot easier. There's no emissions. No, no we're not burning the gas. And as I probably mentioned here, we are, it's all based on modular construction to keep the cost low. The whole thing is going to be built in an Asian shipyard and moved across to this location and put on site. Only thing that's going to be built on site is our tank, if you can't move the tank, and the jetty and the civil works. This way we leverage the local construction, the local labor, avoid all the remote construction costs and all the, all the labor issues that we expect 
a lot of uh, projects to have, and I keep our cars in a shipyard environment, which is obviously the best place to be, especially if it's a Korean shipyard, which is probably the world's most efficient. Well, my slides are not showing up very well here for some reason, but we have finished conceptual design, we have finished feed, uh, pre-feed, we are almost 80% done with feed, about 140,000 hours of engineering has been completed. We have 90 something people, uh, engineers in Korea full time, working on our project. We're gonna be transi transitioning into detailed design very soon. So it's quite exciting, EPC, and we hope to, uh, I'll get to that, but EPC starts after FID, end of next year, early the year after. Uh, you all know Samsung, I'm gonna go really fast. What's really exciting is we're trying to be transparent. Our costs are 1.3 billion is what we are still working on, so $650 a ton. If we can do that, it's not $200 a ton of Equitrol DNA 25 years ago, but it's a lot better than most other projects and very similar to what Shania said this morning. <coughs> I'm gonna just jump with this, but I wanna talk about our transparency and I, and I dare you to ask any other project developer to put a slide like this up that actually says what is the, car, the price we're looking for, what is the, this is all the website, it's not secret at all, we want to be completely transparent about pricing. I think our industry has hurt itself by being super uber secretive for no bloody reason at all. It's a commodity. We should be clear about what prices are being paid, what prices are being cleared. Why do we rely on third parties to make estimates of these things? It's very self-serving. So let's get over that. So for us, if you think that the feed, it's a pure tolling model, feed gas is three bucks. Pipeline tariff, it could be 40 cents, it could be less. You pay us a capacity fee to reserve capacity of 280. You pay us a 45 cent variable charge. We are not the 150% of Henry Hub because we don't want to be at all related to the commodity price. We are a processor. The commodity price list should not be taken by us, should be, or should, and the upside should not be taken by us. It should be taken by the off taker who knows the gas price is better than we do. We just purely get paid to convert natural gas into LNG on your behalf. Very simple. And you can do whatever you want with the gas and where you get the gas, etc., etc. You pay us a total of 280 plus 45 cents. Will you do your own shipping, whatever you think? We can probably deliver to, eight, to Europe for less than eight bucks. And it's, as someone said this morning, if Henry Hub goes up, even if it doubles, well, it doesn't double the price here because most of these things are all fixed. So it's quite an interesting thing. It's hard to sell you a cup of coffee today when you can buy coffee for three bucks. And I'm saying buy a long-term coffee contract for 350. You're gonna say no, I don't want to do that. But you're not getting coffee for three bucks forever. You need to think 20 years. You need to think long term. The chance of American gas staying low is a lot higher. American gas prices staying low is a lot higher than oil prices staying at these levels. And we all would agree with that. So interesting stuff. Uh, we are almost. Let's talk about the FERC process. We will have all our FERC submission reports done in the next few weeks. Uh, so we will have done all the draft filings in the next few weeks. By the end of the year, we hope the folk will tell us, yep, we can do the final filings. By the end of the year, we should have the final filings done. And if all goes right, and there's no issues, we should have our permit by the end of 2016, early 2017. That's when we take up five So that's it. I want to stop on time. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. You guys. So if Matthew has explained to us where the energy has gone